This episode is brought to you by Pass Payments and Norton Abrasives. Welcome to Paint Ed. My name is Torlando and I'm your host. Folks, I am so excited to have you here today. I've got an excellent guest. Uh, this guy is, uh, we've become good friends just by going to Expo and hanging out with each other. Uh, you know, we were down in, in Phoenix having a great time going to the restaurants and talking about business, talking about life. Uh, Jason Phillips from Phillips Home Improvement is with us, uh, you know, right there down in the in, uh, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I love this guy. He is so positive, so smart, also humble and incredibly successful. And I love surrounding myself with successful people because I just, I, I just, I just crave their mentorship. And this guy has always been a, a wonderful mentor to me. Uh, I brought Jason on the show because he has so much experience in the paint industry and he also does other services, added other services to his business. And he's explored the different industries. And here's the deal. We have to be, I think we have to be a little bit honest with ourselves as an industry. Um, compared to some of the other trades, we have a little ways to go in the development, in the system, in the sophistication of our processes and systems. There's so much to learn from other trades. And so he is going to bring some of that knowledge with us today. And we are going to talk about building a leadership team. Now, when I talk to contractors, and and I know this just from being a contractor myself, that establishing that leadership team is so challenging, um, especially when you're going from you to maybe a, a, a couple, you've got some you know crew leads out in the field, um, but getting that project manager, hiring those sales leaders, uh, bringing people in the office, it's such a huge hurdle for a couple of reasons. One, because um, the the overhead, the jump in overhead is really high. But then the other piece, I think, and we'll and we'll discuss this on the show, is is that sometimes you don't know what you need them to do because you have all of the head knowledge up here and you don't have it written down and you don't you know you don't have everything figured out yourself, and so it's really difficult to tell somebody else what they need to do if you're still kind of figuring that out on your own. And so many of, of, uh, of the owners out there are just on that journey to figure that out. And it's not, you know, it's not a bad thing if you haven't gotten there yet. Um, it's just a, a hurdle that you're going to have to climb at some point if you want to grow and, and live, uh, you know, like, like Jason says, to live your life out loud and to have a really rich and fulfilling life. And so I'm so excited to have Jason on the show. Before I bring him on, I just want to make a comment that this show, Paint Ed, is on, uh, it, it's, it's on PCA Overdrive. And if you don't know what PCA Overdrive is, it is PCA's homegrown app that contains all of the wonderful video content that uh, is produced, not just podcasts, but we have professionally trained uh, video series like the Trade Best Practice Series where you can uh, you can give these videos to your crew in the field, the new apprentices, the, the, the folks that, you, that you're training up. You give them the video. You say, here's the task that we're going to do. I want you to watch the video. Then I want you to try it. I'm going to guide you through it, and I'm going to inspect it. It's such a phenomenal way to help uh, train your team up. And there's not not only is there the, this wonderful um, the the paint instruction, but also instruction about running your business profitably from topics to marketing, sales, leadership, um, finances. There's so much content there. 200 plus hours, 4.99, 4.99 a month for non-members free for PCA members. Check out PCA Overdrive at PCAPaintEd.org. All right, let's go ahead and bring Jason Phillips onto the show. Hey, Hi, Jason. Howdy. Wow. Thank you for having me on today. What an, what an honor 
Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. The honor is mine, my friend. The honor is mine. I want to tell you what, man, I love I love listening to you uh, speak to Orlando. I mean, you are an, uh, an inspirational, intellectual speaker and mm. uh, very unique. I love listening to you speak and teach. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. I, I enjoy it at least, you know, and I hope other people do, too. Um, but it's it's a lot of fun. So how's how are things down there in Dallas? How's how's the weather treating you down there? The weather is amazing. Uh, sun is shining. It's warm, and uh, we've we've had a, a couple little hailstorms come through. And you know, we also do roofing, and uh, okay. the roofing industry lives or dies in North Texas based on weather events such as yes, hail. yes. So we do the hail dance. We like to say. Yeah. Okay. So, so the weather's been good to you this, this season so far. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I think that should be like the, the, you know, that should be the test of, you know, that should be the, how are you doing for, for contractors? How's the weather? How's the weather treating you? Yes, we it's have bad. <laughs> it's just been raining. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah. We so, it can, it can rain on Sundays and in the evenings, but we want sunshine during the day so we can get some work done. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so Jason, uh, I, I brought this up in the, in the intro, you know, today we're going to be talking about building the leadership team. Um, you know, you tell us a little bit about, about your team and, um, and I, and I, but I mean, I really want to know about before you start, before you started building that team, what were some of the big hurdles that really were standing in the way of, of just that first start of like bringing on those first couple hires that could really lead? What was, what was the big challenge there? You know, that's a great question to Orlando. When I started, um, I'm a go, I'm a go getter, a lot of energy. And I've, I've got this attitude, like I can do it. I can do anything. And yeah. I, feel like I can do most anything. The problem is, as your business grows, there's too much of that. And although you could do any one of those things or any several of those things, there's not enough time in the day to do them all. And my family was missing out. My, uh, I had no friends. I was working, working, working seven days a week, you know, 12, 18 hours a day. And my, my business was succeeding but my life was suffering. My, the, those around me, especially my family and, and young kids were suffering. And mm -hmm. I, I came to the point of like, okay, I was, I was at a decision point. I'm like, I'm either going to pull back or I'm going to build a team. Yeah. And I chose at that moment, I was going to build a team. So that was the first thing is just making a decision. What do I want from my business? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I met a, a guy recently and uh, a painter in uh, another state. He called me and he said, yeah, I've been painting for 45 years. I'm going to die with a paintbrush in my hand. I don't want a big business. I love painting. Yeah. Right. And that was his vision. And he's living that. That's great for him. That wasn't that wasn't for me. Yeah. Yeah. So when you uh, made that decision and you started, uh, you know, looking looking to assemble your team, where did you where did you begin? Well, the first thing I did is identified the things I hated doing the most, mm -hmm. aka the things I was most likely to avoid, was the worst at, and such. Mm -hmm. And so when I started my business, um, I did everything except the painting. I did the carpentry repairs, the sales, the marketing, the IT, the books, the phones, all of that. Yeah. And so as the business grew, and I was succeeding with marketing and such. Well, I need to hire someone to answer the phones and set appointments for me and to run yeah. the books. Now I need another uh, another uh, salesperson. And just one by one, just started slicing up that pie to where what I, what, what I was doing, where it was broad spectrum, slowly mm -hmm. began to specialize and narrow down. So I, I appreciate that you had the foresight to start with the things that you hated because i think too many of us myself included i i i did this i systematically delegated the things that i knew how to do the best and and, and the things that i loved because i didn't know how to do the other stuff and so i was like oh i got to 
figure out how to do all this other stuff. And, you know, I, I have a system for the painting. I have a system for the sales. Let me hand those off. And, and then I was just kind of like systematically giving me myself the things that I didn't like. And I ended up with only the things that I, that I hated. I had everything else delegated and I, it just wasn't a very fun job, uh, you know, by, by the end of it. So that's, I mean, that, that's, that's, I wish I had that foresight. What do you think made you think, I mean, is it, was it just, it sounds so obvious. You hate this stuff. Why do I, why am I going to put myself through it? I'll hire somebody else to do it. But <laughs> why you know, do you think you from that I did well? The easiest thing to hand off was something you already had a system for. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's part of the, one of the things that gets us started in business is our go get them. We can do it attitude. But the problem with that is, uh, and this really eventually got me stuck was I can do it. I don't need to hear from anybody else. I'll figure it out. So I was like Fred Flintstone, literally going to get a boulder and carving a new wheel every day, making something from scratch every day. And that became a limiting factor. Why? And one day I'm like, well, why do I need to reinvent the wheel constantly? Wow, there's a wheel store over there. Why don't I go over there and find out what wheel best fits my business along with all the other parts and mix them onto my car, my vehicle, my company uh, so that I can get more progress. This isn't about the pride of I can do it. So there's this bravado that, and I've seen a lot of, not just me, I've seen a lot of other business owners deal with that. Yeah. So what gets us to, you know, to first base is not going to get us to second base to third and bring us home where we want to go. Yeah. 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 And so when you first started building that, that leadership team, uh, you know, what were some of the initial false starts or hiccups that you encountered? Mainly um, not knowing for sure what I wanted. It's again, it's one of those things that sounds so simple, but it yeah. wasn't so simple to define, okay, what do I really want this person to do? What does success in this position look like? Uh, that was one. The other one was I didn't, I didn't have a system for sourcing people. I hadn't built a network of people. I eventually went to hire one day mm. and it was like, oh man, oh, I've got too much work. I need someone. And then you end up hiring a friend of a friend of a relative of a whatever who's already unemployed. And there's probably a really good reason why they're unemployed. Yeah, you know, not everybody right. that's unemployed is unemployed for a reason, but many of them are. <laughs> and then you, what happens is you end up bringing people onto your team that are, uh, are, are not the people that you need. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me... <sighs> If, if I, how do I, how do I decide that? How do I figure that out? Well, okay. So here's, here's what I did. Um, I wrote out on a piece of paper, an org chart, you know, with me at the top, I said, okay, I need, I need someone. I had, I was wearing way too many hats. I was spread so thin and I was doing at best a mediocre job at a number of things. Mm. and. So I made my org chart, said, okay, sales manager. I need a, a production manager. I need a marketing manager. And I, you know, I wrote my name in all those boxes, which is kind of like, I, I know a lot of listeners are uh, doing traction, which is the yeah. same, thing, you know, Wickman walks you through in the book traction about making your accountability chart. Of course, mm. back then I just called it an org chart and I wrote my name. And I wrote it out, said, this is my dream team. Wrote my name in all the boxes in those different positions. This is my dream team. And from there, honestly, I just prayed about it. I just said, God, these are, these are the positions I need filled. And I ask for you to help me connect with the right people that I need. Yeah. And so from there, one by one, over the next 12 months, I had every one of those positions filled. And, and growth went from this we took a steep yeah. incline over the next several years. Kind of that hockey stick uh, growth. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's that's really smart. And I and I and I remember I remember doing that myself. Just kind of like just drawing some circles or some boxes and put my name in in each of them. Um, 
did you did you start um how soon i guess did you start with hiring those leadership people on like how many people did you feel like you needed to have in the field in order to uh, account for the extra added overhead that was going to come because you said 12 months later you filled all those positions that's that's a lot of overhead um you know where yeah. like where were you at at that point like to to be able to sustain that I think at that point we were doing um, just under three million dollars at first, mm -hmm. and we, we quickly doubled to uh, a little over five six at that time. You know, and you have to ask yourself. I mean, obviously, I didn't have that in the budget, but yeah. things were growing. You also have to ride that wave, right? And, and there's times when instead of improving your lifestyle with with spending your money. Mm -hmm. Maybe improve your lifestyle by buying your time back, mm. investing in someone, a leader or manager on your team that is then going to, that's still an investment. They're going to, you're going to get that back if you do it right. Yeah. But buying your time back. And that's one of the things I started doing is buying my time back with these positions. So, so here's the, here's the way I answered that question to Orlando. I said, okay, if, if I hire this person today and carve off X amount of money straight from the bottom line, mm -hmm. and I just pay out the whole year's salary right now, yeah. In twelve months, will I be able to look back and say it was worth it or not? And so I, I would frame my question that way: In twelve months, will this have been worth it? Mm -hmm. I think about the the momentum, the the progress, the results that they could get. And if I could answer that with a yes, then I would pull the trigger. Yeah. Yeah. So it, so a lot of, so the average PCA member is at about $1.6 million in revenue. And I think that's important to note for the, for the listener, because, you know, we, we just, we just have a community of, of people who are, who are achieving things and, and you're, you know, you've, you've surpassed that obviously um, at that stage in the game, what do you think is the ideal leadership team? What does that look like? So at, at the, uh, 1.6, 1.7 level, yeah. well, multiple people are going to be wearing many hats. You cannot at that size, you cannot completely specialize. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, you've probably got two people, maybe three people, um, estimating which that's i hate that word estimator that's a, a whole another conversation a whole nother so, one yeah. <laughs> okay yeah. uh sales people and let's you know aside from whatever painters uh workers that you need actually on the ladder you know with the brush but you've got to have some you know two or three sales people you got to have uh admin staff which at that at that place could probably be one single person in the office and um so now you're left with managing projects and uh, helping, helping close the big deals and being the leader. So I would suggest that at that level, you know, you probably need two to three salespeople. The owner would act as the sales manager, have a project manager in charge of, or production manager, depending on uh, how you run it, running all of the, overseeing all of the crews. But okay. you still have to have, you, so someone's got to manage sales. That's a major function. Marketing is a major function. You might be able to group those in, you might not be able to group those in. At our company, they're separate mm -hmm. uh, sales and marketing and production. And, uh, you know, I also have, have an accountant and uh, uh, a human resource. I, I, Jennifer, maybe I'm sure you'll meet Jennifer someday soon. She's yeah. a, still a multi purpose player for us. And, uh, but she's a, a huge leader here that I used. Uh, I, I didn't use, I brought her on because uh, she would help us gain traction in a lot of ways in building our culture. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I, I do want to talk a little bit more about that because I think that you are at your core, a leadership builder, um, a, a leader of leaders, um, which is, uh, I know that you're a big fan of John Maxwell and, in uh, the the five levels of leadership, you know, he talks about level four being that leader of leader. Um, 
before we talk about that, I want to get to that. But before we get there, um, you th- we were talking about painting companies that are 1.6. Oh, nice camera cut. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Let's go to camera two. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> Give me a hard time here. So, so let's go from from one point six to. Uh, I, I want to follow the years that you took to to go from that that range to where you're at now. What? Did, how did how did you conceptualize changing and shifting and adapting your leadership team as you continued to see fast growth? Well, I wish I could say I did it perfectly, but I've I've made. I could write a book on mistakes. I'm sure, you know, many of us could, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, having, uh, one, one of the mistakes I made was I, I didn't have compensation plans that would scale properly. That was a huge mistake I made. And, mm. uh, for instance, you know, if you've got your, you know, I had a sales sales manager and he, he, uh, he was getting paid salary, plus an override of the sales on the team he was leading. Well, you know, in my mind, he was going to get to seven, six to seven salespeople that he could lead effectively and manage effectively. Uh, and then we would have to divide territories or hire an assistant and, and rework the compensation package. Well, uh, as, as we were growing so fast and he was, he was doing a good job, I let him go ahead and take on more than I thought he originally thought he could do mm. well time as, as as time went on the effectiveness of the sales team decreased and his mentoring and oversight of them decreased so our salespeople were burning through more leads they weren't following up on the leads properly they weren't trained properly and so we, we were wasting a ton of money there and i'm not blaming i'm not blaming the the sales manager i'm placing the blame squarely on me. But Mm. at the time I wasn't connected with others and I was just stabbing in the dark at pay plans, just using my own, you know, wit and, and guessing on how to do it. And we, Hey, we did a pretty good job. It got us to where we were going, but made a lot of mistakes and lost uh, a lot of opportunity through, through that mistake in particular. Yeah. So who do who do you look to 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 help you out in in these in these areas? You said that you weren't you were stabbing in the dark, but net but you started reaching out and finding other people to to consult with. So I actually um, hired a consultant uh, back in 2016. So that was that mm-hmm. was a good ways into it. But I, I you know up until that point, I just kept my head my head down, my nose to the grindstone, so to say, just in my own little world. And it wasn't until 2016 that I really, you know, popped my head out and said, "Hey, I want to get connected with the with the network of people." And one of the things that I always want to do is learn from, connect to, rub up against the people who have been where I want to go, yeah, or they're already where I want to go, and I want to learn from them. Why not learn from their wins and their failures? And, and most all business owners are open books. They're yeah. going to tell you their wins, their successes, because there's a lot of pain and th- you know, they don't want you to go through that pain too. And if they can yeah. help a little value to you and you can use their advice and put it into action, they, that adds value to them knowing that they were of value to you. And so just connecting with others and uh, there's there, you know, the painting industry is, as you mentioned, uh, not extremely sophisticated, organized in the way they run the businesses. And even from the way the manufacturers support uh, support the contractors. When you go into other companies or other industries that are similar, such mm-hmm. as window replacement, you know, uh, bathtub shower replacements, roofing, there's a lot more organization there. And you can learn a lot from those from those companies. Although they're 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 selling a different product, yeah. Their sales process is the same. Their their customer is the same. There's so much like ninety percent of it is all the same. And so just yeah. learning from and gleaning from people that have gone before and have and have done what I want to do. 
Yeah. What are some of those things that that other industries are doing, especially in that what you just said with the with the vendor relationship and the in the organization of com- uh, of of companies? What are they doing that we're not doing? Well, you see a lot of uh, industry manufacturer um, training events that are hosted and paid for. I'm not saying there's none of that in the painting industry. But yeah. there is a lot more of that in other industries. How about co-op marketing? How much of that do you see in the painting industry? Not a lot. You're right. And there's there's a ton of that in other industries. So right, that right. support in there, especially, you know, a lot, a lot of these things are dealer networks. You're selling a particular brand. They will send people out to train your people or, you know, take you, bring you into their headquarters to, to train. And, you know, Sherwin Williams does uh, does does some of that uh, more than the others I've, that I've experienced, but nothing compared to the level of of other industries. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and that that sounds about right because you know I I had a, a really strong connection with a Anderson Window, um, you know, local local provider. They do the installation and they also sell the windows and and I mean they were you know an independent com- company, but I mean, they might as well have been an Anderson window company. I mean, like the, the co-branding, the, the tightly knit co-branding that went on, uh, in that, in that company, um, they, they might as well have been, uh, you know, a, a, a franchise almost, you know, but they're not, but like that there's that closeness, right? Yes, indeed. So, <clears throat> okay, so that's one thing that that we can learn from that, and then the the, the idea that yes, they're they're coming in and, and training, and you know, I think to be fair, um, you know, the PCA is doing a, a tremendous amount of of work and effort to to bring that that training, uh, you know, to to the industry, which is which is phenomenal. Um, what uh, what else can we learn? Do you think from from other industries? The, the first thing I would say is together, so someone has solved our problem across the mm-hmm. country. Mm-hmm. And these events, like during COVID, we weren't able to get together. That was terrible. I loved getting together and sitting around the, the, the lunch table or the mastermind table or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter if the guy or the gal sitting across from you started a year ago or 50 years ago, or if they're a, you know, a $200,000 company or a $20 million company, there is something you can learn from every single person. There's a, there's, there are golden nuggets that you can learn. And, uh, if we can continue to get together as an industry and share knowledge, Mm -hmm. that's a, that is a great start is sharing that knowledge. And that's, that's what I love about the PCA expo. Yeah. Getting together and, and, you know, oh wow, you deal with that. Well, here's what you know. Here's what we did. This is what helped us. So I, I think the peer to peer is is huge. Um, of course, you know, there's a lot of times there's people that are trying to teach that don't know how to do, mm-hmm. and don't ever listen to those people. You know, mm-hmm. I want to I want I want to learn from business people who aren't teaching theory. I want to I want to learn from business people that have battle scars. Yeah. That have been through it, that have conquered. Those are the people that I want to connect with, and I think that's the best thing that we could uh, that we could do as an industry is is stay together. Of course, yeah. when we get together, you know, the, this paint manufacturer, all of their training is going to be centered around selling their brand, right? And every, that's everybody's got their own opinions about what type of paint that they're going to use. And I, where I feel we're lacking is is the Painters don't need training on how to paint a house or whatever they're yeah. painting. Okay. What they need is they need to learn about leadership and building a business. Okay. At the, at the end of the day, you know, no, no one ever did anything great. If you want to build your business, you have to build a team. And the skill set for building a team is completely different than from painting a house or even running, even running a paint crew. Right. The skill set is totally different. You may be an expert over here, but if you want to build your business, you start off as an amateur and you have to have the mindset of, hey, what got me here isn't going to get me where I want to go. I need to learn. I need to improve. 
And it really starts with taking personal responsibility that I'm in control. I'm the leader of the ship and yeah. I'm going to improve me. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what are, what are some of the qualities that you feel like are absolutely essential, essential to become a leader of leaders? To become a leader of leaders. The yeah. number one thing is integrity. If, um, you, your, your followers or the people you're leading, they don't have to always like what you say, but if they don't believe what you say, you have no credibility and you're just going to be, you know, taking a walk. It, it comes down to trust. Trust is the currency of business between, between us and our customers. It's also the trust on our teams and it is the foundation of, of building a leadership team. You take a team that doesn't trust one another and everybody is going to be fighting. They're going to, they're not going to be clear and transparent, and honest with each other to talk about the real issues. They're going to mm -hmm. be marketing for their, you know, for their department or to their, for their team rather than the betterment of the company. So it, the trust is absolutely vital. Now, having said that you need to create an environment as a leader that your people can, can be transparent with you and still be safe. Right. That, that your people can come in and say, look, Torlando, man, I totally dropped the ball, whatever that is. Yeah. And you know, and what I've always told my people is, is look, mistakes happen, whether it's a mistake, a mess up, whatever it is, bring it to me and together we can deal with this. But if I have to hear about it from a third party, it's going to be way worse. Yeah. Right. Let's, let's just be honest and open with one another. Yeah. I think safety in the, in the workplace, uh, just like emotional safety in the workplace is as important as physical safety. Uh, I think it comes up more frequently. I think that your, your emotional safety is at risk more frequently than your physical safety is. And I think that uh, a lot of leaders don't recognize how much the power that they hold how that creates an unsafe setting. Uh, you know, it, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe try to think of an example here or maybe just expound on, on that idea. Um, you know, power comes from position in a lot of ways. Um, and if you are the one signing the paycheck, there's this baseline fear that if I, uh, if I mess up, or if I speak my mind too much, or if I get in too much of a disagreement, that I will lose my job, right? There's just this, this fear that if I push too hard, my whole world can come crashing down. And that fear limits the amount of openness that we get from our people. And I, I, you, as, a, as a leader, you just don't you're not aware of it. You don't see it. You think that you're open. You think that it's that it's that you're creating a safe space, but all too often you're just not. And that is limiting your people from, from actually growing and, and, and telling you that you have no clothes. The emperor has no clothes, right? You're, you're absolutely right. It is so important. You know, the, the fear of losing your job. If you, if you do something wrong, we're, we're fans here. I'm a proponent of having regular conversations with your team regular. They shouldn't, you shouldn't wait to for quarterly or annual reviews to tell someone they're winning or losing. Yeah. If, if, if they're slightly off track, then if there's violated expectations, you owe it to them as a leader to identify that and discuss it with them sooner rather than later because the the quicker the 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 quicker you address it with them the easier it is for them to fix and the less irritation and problem it is for your company right. so so having that that clear communication and they need to feel like they're 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 a true team member you know they say so many people say oh no don't don't be friends with uh with your employees don't be friends with your employees well i understand why they say that but I, I disagree with it. Mm. The problem is the, the perception and what normally happens is if, if you're close to your employees, maybe, maybe you're not uh, strong enough to tell them the truth and to lead them and to fire them if necessary. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we, we have a term here on, uh, at our company and we, we took the word team and family and we put them together 
into a silly word called teamily. Mm. We, we work together like a team, but we care for one another like a family. And we put that together. And we, you know, if, if, if I truly care about someone, I am going to find a way to tell them the truth. And, yeah. and so it's, there's this, okay, over here on, on the pendulum. Okay. I'm, I'm over here and you're just an employee, get results. I don't care. I'll fire you. Okay. Yeah. That's one side of it. Then, then you get this other side that is, that is, oh, hey, we're buddies. We're having a great time at work. You love me. I get great reviews from you, but we're not getting any results. Right. Because I can't, because I can't hold you, hold you accountable, which is a whole nother story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. For another time. But, but not in between those two, I think past way over to the other side is I'm going to care about you as my teammate and our team so much that I'm not going to, I'm not going to be, uh, allow things that need to be discussed to go undiscussed. Yeah. And that's a key trait of a leader is the ability to have, um, Crucial Conversations, which happens to be an amazing book that I recommend to all leaders, mm -hmm. along with a companion book called Crucial Accountability. These books will literally give you tools on how to have better conversations uh, in every area of your life, not just at work, not just with your boss, not just with your peers or your employees, but with your spouse and your children. And if, if you are a person that wants to be a better leader, and I hope you are, those are two amazing resources that will up your game. Yeah. The, the, that idea of, you know, I, I've, I've always thought that uh, the, the idea of family in a, in a business was maybe a little hokey. Um, but what you're kind of making me, what's, what's really kind of popping out here is the, the family dynamic in that you are going families have those conversations families are not afraid of confrontation with each other um and it's and it's because uh you're you're stuck with each other you, you know it's like you're not gonna all of a sudden not be family uh so, you know That's your right. brother it's just like you're just you're gonna say what's on your mind because you can't you can't live with it any longer right and and you're gonna have to live with it and so what i like about the 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 idea of bringing in a uh, pulling that into the the team dynamic is that it i think it says hey look it's going to take a lot for this relationship here to be severed so we're going to be able to have these types of conversations and get through stuff uh because because we're together like this this is it and that's and i'm not saying don't like don't fire people, but there's an element of if it's hard to get fired, then that's where openness, honesty, vulnerability can actually make a home. Absolutely. You know, the, how about there's people and this, this breaks my heart when I hear this happening. I call a meeting with someone and after they go, oh man, I thought I was going to get fired today. The very thought that that was the tension that was building in them as they're walking to my office kills me. Yeah. And so I think there's, there's two ways uh, to help combat that. One is that you have a clear, progressive, disciplined policy that everybody understands. It's one thing that, that it's written down, but it's another thing that they understand. Hey, when there's an issue, here's how we handle it. Mm -hmm. And the other one is I, I generally try to start those conversations um, by saying, hey, I've, I've got something. I, I want us to work through this. I've got an issue I want to talk about, and I need you and I to work together to solve this problem. Yeah. And just kind of build a bridge initially rather than, you know, think it's going to explode on them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so as you're developing that, that uh, leadership team, um, what, what are you, th what, how much time do you put into this? Because I, because I think that there are a lot of, business owners who have this impression that if they build a business um, and they build a system and they hire a bunch of people to run it, then that means that they can go vacation for half of the year and have a business that's uh, functioning and running and, 
and that somehow a service company can become this passive income tool. And I don't think that you and I think you and I are a little bit on the same page that that's that's maybe not why we should be completely in business. Um, and that's probably not completely real uh, for, for a service-based company. Um, tell me how involved are you with your leadership team? I spend approximately 50% of my time in various meetings with my leadership team, uh, leadership development, solving problems, level 10 meetings, mm -hmm. uh, approximately 50% of my time is, is spent uh, developing them and helping clear the roadblocks so that they can do their job. Yeah. And, and why do you think that that's important? Like, what's your advice to leaders who are, are trying to balance that? Like, they do want the freedom because, you know, I mean, why, why, you know, run a business without the ability to have a little bit of freedom over your life? But what can you say to, to leaders to, to help them figure out how to strike that balance? The, the balance between, uh, between that? yeah, I'm sorry, freedom between freedom and being involved in those meetings. So you said you spend 50% of your time. Is that 50% of your workday, 50% of your time period? 50% like, of my workday. Yeah. Yes. And so if you, if you never give someone an opportunity, you never extend trust. You're always going to be doing everything yourself. And like we talked the other day, you know, the, the, the wheel is spinning, but the hamster is dead. Mm -hmm. you, don't want, you don't want to burn out. You have to understand that handing someone off to handing something off to someone is a risk. And yes, they could fail, mm -hmm. but give them something that where they can fail in a safe environment and you can help them learn from that. You know, it's one thing to trust someone with brain surgery that's never touched it. It's mm -hmm. another thing to touch someone or to, to uh, trust someone to uh, run one of your business processes or handle, uh, you know, uh, a difficult, high, uh, highly sensitive customer. Ah. <laughs> it's, it's not the same as brain. You know, you make a mistake in brain surgery, someone's dead. Yeah. And you, you have to let people uh, make a mistake, and, but then you have to coach them through so that they don't continue to make that mis mistake later. Now, this, this, this freedom, if we, don't, if we don't create a vacuum, people won't rise to fill it. Mm -hmm. If we are the owner that's always there, we're the earliest to work, we're the hardest worker, we're the latest one there, working every Saturday, whatever, then they're just going to let you do it. You're the boss. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you, you've got to say, Hey guys, I need some help. Someone needs to take care of that. And there's a mindset shift of, wow, well, I, I don't feel like I'm being a good leader because I'm not leading by example. Yeah. As a leader, yes, you do want to lead by example, but you, um, you have to get results through the actions of others and your job as a leader, that mindset shift is helping going from doing the job to managing the process or the people that are doing the job and you've got to give it to them and it, back to the old uh pareto the 80 20 rule mm -hmm. you know if they can do it at least 80 percent as good as you can give it to them because now they're going to be able to have more attention and focus and they're going to go well beyond 100 percent and probably do it 120 percent as good as you were doing it yeah yeah for sure and, and so what, uh, what does the other 50% of your time look like in your work day? Uh, the other 50% of my time would be dealing with, um, okay. So I spend my time leading the leadership team, uh, dealing with high level, um, relationships. Like I, I'm the one that manages our relationship with all of our primary vendors. Mm. And, uh, for instance, we are in the uh, process of of purchasing a building, a new building for a company. I'm the one that's handling that. And I'm the one that's looking down the, down the road for where we're going to be. You know, my, my, uh, my leaders and managers are looking, you know, say for instance, quarterly, monthly, mm -hmm. weekly. I'm looking, you know, next year, next five years. And I'm working on those types of tasks that are not in the daily routine. I am not in the 
I am not in the workflow of anything that happens daily regard, yeah. regarding marketing, leads, sales, production, customers, collections, none of that. Yeah. And I think that mindset shift of, of the time factor of I'm looking at the year, I'm looking at the, the next five years. Um, I think that is a hard thing to get out of um, or to, to get to when, when you are just thinking about, you know, how are we going to get these jobs done this, you know, this month? Um, how are we going to get cash in, in the, in the door this month, this week? Um, it's a, that's a really difficult thing to, to get to. Um, so, so with your uh, team, your leadership team, what kind of training do you put them through in order to handle some of these, um, some of these more high level things? I mean, cause, cause you're talking, I mean, you're, you're talking mile high um, and, and, you know, you're talking about buying buildings and, and uh, you know, the, these top vendor relationships, but um, how do we, how do we train people to think in terms of the quarter and the year and not just the next handful of jobs? Well, one is creating clarity of vision and, you know, we live in a quarterly world and we, we set quarterly goals and we track, uh, we, we have certain goals and certain things, metrics that are weekly, uh, you know, for instance, you're a salesperson, you're making commission. We get paid week. You get paid weekly on that. Mm -hmm. And, but for our managers and our leaders, they, we, we've connected, uh, compensation rewards with monthly and uh, quarterly objectives or metrics or numbers, whatever. And it helps everybody. It's like when you can, when, when you connect compensation to desired outcomes and results, it's whether you say you're a money motivated person or not, it's mm -hmm. this little voice that's always speaking back there to you, helping guide you in mm -hmm. the right direction. And so part of it is just, you know, that, that will help get anyone on board. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's, but that's just one, one piece of it. Um, may, creating clarity about, Hey, this is what our next five years looks like. Okay. This is where we want to be in five years. And we, when I, when I paint the picture of here's our five-year vision, I, I want every one of my teammates to see themselves as a part of that vision in an expanded role over what they're doing right now. I want them to see opportunity that their life is going to be better as this company grows and makes more profits. Mm -hmm. The the way, you know, the way we say it here is, is we have three pillars for success. And uh, the, the first one is we have to have a thriving culture, a place where it's safe to come to work, where you love the people you work with. Of course you're challenged, but we share the blood, sweat and tears together. Okay, yeah. We have to have a thriving culture. The second one is we have to have wowed customers, not customers that are just happy or just happen to pay their bill begrudgingly. We mm -hmm. need our customers to be raving fans that are going to sing our praises. When we're done, they're going to tell a story after we finish. What story are they going to tell? And it's yeah. gonna, that's going to make a difference on our bottom line. And then the next thing that we need for, for our future success is we have to have profits. Profits help us weather a COVID year. Help us weather the winter. Profits help us finance the future. And uh, that when you paint that picture, people start thinking, yeah, the company does need to make profits. If I, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to be a part of this vision. So yeah. now you've got that five, you know, that five-year vision, then you just break down, okay. So where do, where can we be in one year from now? Where do we need to be in one year from now? Okay, let's break that down. What do we need to do in the next 90 days to make sure we're on track? Okay, so then 90 days, that's 13 weeks. We break our, week, our, our 90 day goals down into uh, 13 weekly reportable metrics of progress at that point. So you know if you're hitting your weeklies, you're on track with your, with your quarterly. Yeah. So that, those are some of the things we do to help, help our managers and leaders get, get their head out of the trenches. You know, they need to have their head in the trenches a lot, but they, got, they need to poke their head up and look and make sure they're headed in the right direction on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's so awesome. So if we're, if we're doing all of this right and we're, and we're building that leadership team, we're giving them the, the, the key metrics for success and we're actually present and coaching them continually spending half of our time, uh, actually leading our leadership team. 
uh, what does life look like at, on the other side of the, of the bridge? Oh, well, <laughs> it's, uh, I love what I do. I love my life. I am, you know, I am passionate about people and I wasn't passionate about painting when I got in the painting business, but I was passionate about helping people. Well, when we renew and restore someone's home, make it beautiful again, we're helping people, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And now my day to day isn't personally doing that. My day to day is my own team. And uh, so now when I'm not working, what am I doing? I am uh, living my life, l spending times, spending time with the ones I love. I call it living out loud, pursuing mm -hmm. your purpose. You know, my company, my business is, is a huge part of what I do and who I am, but it is not me. My, my business is not my calling. My business is a tool that's going to help me serve my purpose and my dreams and my calling in life. And guess what? It's going to improve a lot of other people's lives at the same time mm -hmm. that, that share that same, that, that, that can benefit as well. And, uh, you know, I love, we have five children and, uh, absolutely love spending time with, with the family, you know, mountain biking, working out, swimming. Mm -hmm. uh, I like all kinds of different cars and stuff. So working on cars, driving cars, mm -hmm. uh, hanging out at the swimming pool, love doing that stuff. I spend, believe it or not, I spend a fair bit of time. Uh, I have focused time because when I'm at my office, I'm engaged with people the whole time. Yeah. And I need that time where I can focus. Well, as long as the weather is good, my focus time happens on my patio with my computer, my iPad and the birds chirping in the background. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Jason, thank you so much for, for being on the show today. Where can uh, people connect with you? Where should I send them? Well, of course, there's my, my uh, company's website, phillipshomeimprovements.com. Or if you're on Facebook, uh, you just look me up. Uh, it's it's facebook.com slash uh, Phillips Jason W. I would love to connect with anyone. I'm passionate about people. I'm passionate about uh, developing leaders, especially business leaders. So I'd love to connect with you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, I'm going to send you backstage and, and close out the show. All right, there we have it, Jason Phillips. Uh, man, what a what a high energy, awesome, good nature, just good human. Um, I mean, just imagine what it would be like to to work on his team. Imagine what it would be like to have somebody who you could uh, walk in to the office and say, "I got this problem," and he's not going to say, "Oh, here we go again." He's going to say, "What is it?" let's let's solve this together let's find a solution together you don't have to be afraid of your employment i would love to be that kind of leader to my people um such a such an inspiration to talk to him um couple things about the pca things that are super super cool there are so many people like jason he's fairly unique but there are so many people who are just phenomenal business leaders, phenomenal people who are willing to share their expertise, share their, their battle scars, as he said. Uh, we have the Ask a Peer Network uh, that you could be a part of where you can actually connect with other business leaders in the PCA and feed from their, uh, from their aura and all their knowledge and wisdom. Um, such a great place to find a, a mentor. Uh, do me a favor and go to Facebook and join our group, the Paint Ed Group. Uh, there's always great discussions about paint on there. Um, subscribe to the show, download Overdrive, and uh, and join our wonderful community of paint contractors. Uh, love you all. Have a great uh, rest of your week, rest of your day, rest of your quarter, and uh, we will see you next time. <laughs>